Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. It's good to see you in God's house on this Sunday evening. And we're going to read together from the Old Testament. I don't think you get much Old Testament preaching. Uh, to be an Old Testament, uh, a New Testament Christian, it's a bit like uh, breathing with one lung. Because God gave us the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, Martin Luther says the Old Testament is the cradle in which the Christ child is laid. Isn't that wonderful? And, and so much in the Old Testament appeals to our hearts and speaks to our minds. And so I'm going to read a section from Deuteronomy and speak about extracts from this wonderful book. Deuteronomy means deuteronomos means second law. Did you know that deutero means two and nomos means law in Greek? And so it's the second law, it's the preached law, it's the Ten Commandments preached by Moses on the, on the borders of the promised land. And so it's, it's wonderful. Um, we're going to read Deuteronomy 6, um, verses 1 to 12. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you, to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. Hear, O Israel, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echaz. The little Jewish boys learn to say that every day. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your heart, hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols in your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig. I should be pressing a button or something here. No, is it okay? Um, <laughs> and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. What a wonderful passage of scripture. You know, it was about three months after leaving Egypt, and that was a miracle. Egypt was the most organized power ever seen in the world. And they got out of it. God took them out with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. He took them out of Egypt. And within three months, they were in a desert. Uh, the desert of Sinai. And the desert conveys different ideas to different folk. A desert can be a place of despair. In Deuteronomy 8.15, it tells you about it, a place of despair. The Lord led you through the vast and dreadful desert, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water <coughs> out of the hard rock. So a desert can be a place of despair, but it also can be a place of decision. And going into uh, Judges in chapter 24, sorry, Joshua chapter 24, um, it's a place of decision. They were on the, the borders of the promised land, and uh, he says, If serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. And then a text that Gordon Thompson's got in his front, in front of his house. 
But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So the desert can be a place of despair, it can be a place of decision, or it can be a place of dreams. Um, the prophet Hosea in particular he looks back on uh, the time in the desert as a time when they, they were closer to God than they were later on. And it says in, in Hosea chapter 2 and verse 14, God says, Therefore I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back her vineyards and will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. So a desert can be a place of dreams as well as a place of decision. The great thing is, who's your leader in the desert? Um, what's your leader like? Survival and success depends on the leader. And Moses was their leader for most of the time they were wandering in the wilderness, but God was their leader. And they looked back and they remembered I remember in Jean's house when I was permitted within the precinct and, <laughs> and not just condemned to stay outside till she rattled the bottles at, bottles at half past like ten to call her wee daughter in. <laughs> it said in the bathroom, please remember, don't forget, never leave the bathroom wet. <laughs> well, I looked through Deuteronomy, 14 times in this book, God says to them through Moses, remember. Remember, don't forget God's deliverance. And I think of my childhood. Sometimes on a Thursday, my mother used to get a bowl, and she used to get bits of hard bread and break them into the bowl. And then she put boiling water over the, the bread and drained the hot water off with a saucer and then put some sugar on it and a wee drop of milk. She said, that will do you to Friday, son. And that's what it was like. And this week, our daughter volunteered to make the Christmas dinner. And she put a bit of paper up in the fridge. And it said, uh, soup. Or, what's that other stuff beginning with a PG? Uh, <laughs> prawns. Soup or prawns. Um, turkey. Or beef. Uh, and then we had carrots, Brussels sprouts, parsnips. We never got tasted parsnips till I went to London. In the London Bible College they had parsnips. They had other things as well. They used to give us sheep's hearts. And I used to say, we feed this to dogs in Scotland. But, um, <laughs> you know, we got parsnips. And we got uh, gravy. And we got Desserts, a, a choice of about three or four desserts. And I thought, things have changed. <laughs> and not just eating-wise. You know, since I became a Christian, it's like changing, if you can use a spiritual metaphor, <laughs> it's like changing from saps to roast beef in Yorkshire food. <laughs> it's wonderful to know the difference that Jesus makes in our lives and, and the, the Israelites were reminded by God and there are three things to remember and that will do me tonight Okay, number one number one is remember God's love and in Deuteronomy and chapter oh wait a minute I have to press this sometime have I? I haven't read Mark 3 but um what am I doing now? <laughs> ah, the desert could be a place of despair. I've dealt with that, haven't I? And then, <laughs> the desert could be a place of dreams. Um, what else? Is it a testing time for us? Well, it was a testing time for them, yes. It sure was. And I've jumped about 15 slides, so I don't know what I'll do now. Uh, remember God's love, he loved you. Deuteronomy 7, verses 7 and 8. 
wonderful verses. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other people's. For you were the fewest of all peoples. He casts around as to try and figure out why God should love us. And I've often thought about that as I've remembered my past. Why should God love me? And he outlines to them the state they were in. He says, God didn't love you because you were plentiful. Verse 7. He says, it wasn't because you were more numerous than other peoples on the earth. And we'll move on. It wasn't because you were powerful, a strong nation. Verse 17, um, he says to them, You may say to yourselves, these nations are stronger than we are. How can we drive them out? They, they weren't a powerful nation, the Jews. They were a political football down the years. And it wasn't because you were pure. Chapter 9, verse 5. Um, it wasn't because they possessed holiness that would en endear them to God. Um, he says, Do not say to yourself, The Lord has brought me here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness. And I know what I was like before I was converted. I was a rotten, wee, blaspheming, lying, thieving, truanting boy. And, and it wasn't because I was pure. And it wasn't because you were pliable. Chapter 9 um, and verse 13 uh, it says there, The Lord said to me, I have seen this people and they are a stiff-necked people indeed. And the image of, of this is of course a horse, a donkey. <clears throat> and the word's used stiff-necked, isn't it? Um, I like the Jerusalem Bible, the Catholic translation is uh, because um, <laughs> because you're a headstrong people. Headstrong's a good word for us. Headstrong. We don't want to go God's way. We want to go our way. And he says, remember God's love. He didn't love you because you had all these things. And he, he really runs out of reasons, doesn't he? He says, why did the Lord love you? The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous, blah, blah. But it was because the Lord loved you. The Lord loved you. Why? Because the Lord loved you. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? He loved us. That's why he loves us. Isn't it wonderful? Here in his love, John says, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, which means the the means of offering pardon to sinners. You know, it's absolutely wonderful to think that God loves us. In Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When I was a boy of 12, I came to realize that. I thought Jesus was a swear word. And then I heard, I was called one night, and out the cold from Lamhill, tram terminus, then a mission hall and heard a man talking about Jesus as something other than a swear word. And then I realized when a speaker one night said, if you had been the only sinner in the world, the Lord Jesus would still have come and died for you. What a wonderful saying. Yeah? He loves us because he loves us. The greatest professor of theology in the 20th century was arguably a man called Carol Bart. A very, very clever man. And he was being interviewed one day and they said to him, if you weren't a theologian, Professor Bart, what would you like to be? If I were not a theologian, it was a German, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I would like to be a traffic warden. <laughs> and, he, and then he said, Come to think of it, a theologian is a kind of traffic warden. <laughs> he traffics in ideas. He said, what's the greatest thing you've discovered in your life, Professor Barton? He said, the greatest thing I've discovered in my life is that Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And so, remember God's love. That's the first thing. God loves us. And we should be a loving people. 
we should be showing the love of God to other folk. Jim was talking about this this morning, <laughs> and so I can dovetail with the pastor uh, today. God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died, Christ died for us. Remember, remember, don't forget, remember, first of all, God's love. Then, remember God's leadership. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 2. Um, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and test you in order to know what was in your heart whether or not you would keep his commands. Remember God's leadership. God led you all the way. And you know we can call on the guidance of God. His Holy Spirit guides us. You know Paul was going to go one direction. The Holy Spirit said go that direction and evangelize Europe. <laughs> you know it's a small commission. And so he went to Macedonia. He went to Philippi. He went to magnify God's grace all over the place and he picked out strategic centres that would be nucleating centres as the scientists say nucleating centres from which the gospel would spread around you know God leads us and it's not always pleasant and it's not always agreeable and it's not always things that we would plan I remember planning to go to London Bible College when folk were saying to me, um, George, you should be preaching, you should be teaching, you, you, should, you should be at the best college in Britain with the brain that God has given you. And so I applied. And I went for an interview, 13 and a half hours each way by bus to London at that time. And I was in the back shift when I came off from 3 till 11. I came out off the bus about 11 o'clock and I went into work like a zombie. Uh, in the afternoon to work in the laboratory and I was there for 15 minutes you know what they spoke about they spoke about would I be able to play for the first 11 at football they'd heard I could play some football <laughs> and they didn't ask very much about my conversion and I had an apostolic defence of the gospel all ready for them and they weren't like that but they let, they let me in and that was lovely and then I discovered that I wouldn't get a grant because the English University counted Scottish hires as O grades. O levels. Which was a terrible insult. I had five hires <laughs> and I could have got into any Scottish University. But God wanted me there. And I, I stayed there. And I learned what it was to trust in the Lord for money. I got £700 in gifts that year. It was astonishing. And then I, got, I, I did the A-levels off. We buns to a Scottish student of hiring, hiring, and so on. And then I got a grant for the other three years, £330 a year, £110 a term. I wouldn't call the king my cousin. And uh, <laughs> it, was, it was really great. God led you to humble you. My mother once wrote, Dear George, I am skint. We were a poor family, you know. Dear George, I am skint, could you help me? And I had ten, a £20 in the post office savings bank, and I sent her £10. I was going away to ha half, for half term to Virginia Water in Surrey to a smashing bungalow and all that kind of stuff. And the following day, I got a £20 money order from somebody. <laughs> the Lord gave me more than double what I'd given away. That's what God is like. That's how God leads us. Trials, troubles, hardships. In the Bayer Tapestry, there's a wonderful bit in the, in the tapestry with a, 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 a soldier, it says, a, a leader encouraging his troops and the soldier sticking a spear into a soldier's backside. <laughs> <laughs> encourages his troops. Sometimes God gives us a jag and makes us go in his direction. Trials, troubles, hardship. There's a man called Samuel Rutherford. Uh, oh, I'm getting lost here, never mind. <laughs> he led you to test you. That's true. Um, 
Are you having testing times in your life? Physical illness, bereavement, examination failure, trouble at work. What, ha what problem have you got? Family problems? Well, here's what Samuel Rutherford said. When he was a wee boy down in, in the borders in Anmos, he came in late one day and he said, Where have you been, Samuel? I said, I fell down a wall, a well, and a bony white man pulled me out. <laughs> and we think God sent an angel when he was about eight years old to deliver him out of the well. And here's what Samuel Rutherford wrote a lot of wonderful things, but here's one. Is God ploughing in your life? Be encouraged, he says. He purposes fruit. God led you to humble you. God is ploughing in your life and he'll bring forth fruit. He doesn't give us a hard time just for the sake of it. It gives us a hard time so that we'll grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So remember God's leadership. And we'd rather be in the hands of God than the hands of a whole lot of Philistines around us that would murder us. We've got half a chance. And it's not very good. Recap. Remember God's love. He loved you because he loved you. Remember God's leadership. He led you to humble you. And then briefly, um, remember God's labor. He brought us out to bring us in. Now, Pastor Jim this morning, he burst, he burst into song and prayer meetings and stuff like that. And he, he was singing something about he brought us out. It's a chorus. Um, I'd never heard it before. And we hadn't heard a way far beyond Jordan for about 50 years. <laughs> Gina and I swapped notes at the choruses that you sing. And we really enjoy the fellowship. Thank you very much. He brought us out to bring us in. That's really good, isn't it? Um, and God does that. He brought us out to bring us in. God's labour. Remember, God's labour. He works on us. We used to have a stick in the back of the car, remember? Uh, where it says, be patient with me, God isn't finished with me yet. <laughs> and we can say that to our fellow Christians very often. Um, he brought us out to bring us in through suffering and trial, uh, through all kinds of things. He brought us out to bring us in and he won't let, he won't let go of us. Mr. Paxson, what's his name? Pawson, notwithstanding. Um, there's an old hymn that says, My name from the, ha the palms of his hands, eternity will not erase. Engraved there forever it stands in marks of indelible grace. Yes, I to the end shall endure. <laughs> um, I to the end shall endure as sure as the earnest is given. More blessed, but not more secure. The glorified spirits in heaven. It's the shepherd's job to keep the sheep. He brought us out to bring us in. And many of God's children have had a very hard time of it. There was another man called Andrew Melville. I don't know if you've heard of him. He lived a wee bit before me, back in the, around the year 1600, for example. <laughs> uh, Andrew Melville... He was a head man in Glasgow University. He became the head man in St Andrews University. And he became the head man in Aberdeen University. He was, he was brilliant. A wonderful scholar. Um, uh, and uh, he's known as the father of Protestantism. He took over from John Knox, really. An impetuous and abrasive man, he <laughs> said about him. Uh, he was a superb scholar with an encyclopedic mind which absorbed learning of many kinds. He was an expert in Middle Eastern languages, for example. And he won a reputation for Scotland as a, an academic, high-flying country because of his glorious mind that God had given him. And he had a hard time of it because 
he came across King James the sixth and first. Have you ever heard of him? King James, we know his Bible, his translation, the 1611 translation, but he, he wasn't a terribly nice man. Uh, and, and he met up with Andrew Melner, and he made two speeches. And the scholars divided as to whether it was in two years, 90, uh, 1595 and 1596. He made two speeches. The two kingdom speeches are called Before the King. Imagine talking like this before the King. He said, I would just like to remind you, sir, <laughs> that there are two kings and two kingdoms in Scotland. There's the kingdom run by King James, that's you, you're in charge. He said, and the kingdom run by King Jesus, in which you are neither a king nor a lord, but a subject. <laughs> Imagine how to win Jews and influence Gentiles with a speech like that. I mean, it wasn't very good. In fact, he spent four years in the Tower of London as a prisoner from 1607 to 1611. And then he got exiled. Before that, he was isolated. He was silenced by the king. He wasn't allowed to preach in St. Andrews in English. <laughs> He was a good man, he was speaking English anyway, he was a Scotsman. But um, <laughs> he wasn't allowed to preach, and he wasn't allowed to speak at the assembly of the Presbyterian Church, and he was sent for exile. He spent the last years of his life away from his beloved Scotland. But God brought him through, and that is what God is like. He brought you out to bring him in, bring you in. And when, we're, when Christ brings us in, it's so wonderful. We have him, we have his Holy Spirit. We've got this wonderful Bible. Moses preached to the Jews before they went into the promised land and he reiterated a whole lot of the moral teaching of God in the Ten Commandments and in other teaching in uh, <clears throat> the other books of the early uh, Bible books. And we have his Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. I always think the Holy Spirit's the shy member of the Trinity. His, his whole ministry is to make Jesus more real to us. Amen. And the more we know the Holy Spirit's guidance and thought and preparation, the more we know uh, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives mediated through the Holy Spirit. And then we've got Christian fellowship. Gene and I have enjoyed the fellowship. Um, it looks as if some folk believe that the devil goes on summer holidays. Because we, we couldn't get a midweek service to go to. <laughs> so we said, oh, we'll go to the Assemblies of God <laughs> and see how we got on. And we got a lovely welcome from you. Thank you very much. We've got fellowship, you know. And it, fellowship with all kinds of people. We had a man called Les Henson. He came up from Hartley Cole and he came to work in the pits in uh, Cardowan Colliery and uh, as a mining engineer. And uh, he had no digs to stay in. But there was a man called John Greenshield, some of you may have heard of. And the Greenshield parents, John's parents, uh, gave him lodgings. And after three months, he said, I couldn't do anything else but trust in Jesus. When I saw this old couple and how they lived in their house. And Les, he met Vapke Giersma, who was a student from the Netherlands and came to the BTI in Glasgow. And the two of them got married and went out to Jaya. That's Dutch New Guinea, it used to be called, as missionaries. And uh, it was just wonderful. We used to argue, Les and I, when he came home in furlough. And he said, listen, Mitchell, he said, he said, the elder, the senior elder in my church in Irian Jaya has eaten better men than you. <laughs> the tribe he belonged to were, were former cannibals. And he said, this man had killed and eaten at least part of 25 people. And he said, he's eating better men than you. But God prepared Les and Vapke.
became field directors out there, uh, working from Australia. God brought them out, and he brought them in, and God used them greatly. Um, and so the Lord encourages us very much, and you can have a hard time of it. Um, in Deuteronomy 4.20, uh, Moses says to the folk, he brought you out of the iron furnace. That always interested me because I worked for five years in the steel industry as a metallurgist. And I worked for about three years in Clyde Iron Works, Stoke Cross, where they were making cannonballs for the Napoleonic Wars. And we had three of these big blast furnaces, 100 feet high. Wonderful. And the three items of the production of iron were burdened, the load that went in the top, heat, we blasted the heat in the bottom part of the, the bustle main of the furnace, we could generate temperatures above 2000 degrees cent, uh, centigrade or Celsius if you like, and then the third thing was the pressure of the load coming down the furnace and then coming out the tap holes, uh, the slag tap hole, the metal tap hole, pressure. Sometimes our lives are like that. Burdens, heat and pressure. And God brought them out. And he brought them out for good. Some of them wanted to go back. They wanted the salad that you get in Egypt. And they were moaning to Moses for salad. And God gave them <coughs> manna and quail. Which was a very good diet. Um, he brought them out and he brought them out for good. And the, the, the Lord of hosts was with them. Adonai Sivaoth Imanu, the Lord of hosts is with us. Elohe Yaakov Tsurenu, the God of Jacob, is our refuge. We can go at any time and be defended by him. And so tonight my glorious task to talk to you about that. What should I do in the light of all that? Well, here's a picture. We have it in Glasgow. It's in the art galleries there. The man who bought it, it's, it was by Salvador Dali, who was half daft, as we were saying in Glasgow. But he was a wonderful artist, and he, wrote that one, he, he painted that wonderful picture, Christ of St. John of the Cross, by Salvador Dali. And the man nearly got hung for it. He nearly lin they nearly lynched him because he spent £6,000 buying a painting. And <laughs> it's, 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 folk come from all over the world to see it. But it's the truth behind it that matters. The Lord Jesus died on a cross for us and he's looking over the fishermen and the ordinary folk down below at the Sea of Galilee. What should I do? Number one, connect with God's love through repentance and faith. Trust in the Lord Jesus. He's worth your trust. The second thing you should do is conform to God's leadership. He leads you. This wonderful God. He leads you to humble you. And we're supposed to do what he tells us and go in the direction he points us to. And we'll know blessing. There's only one safe place to be. And that's in the centre of God's will. Doing what he wants us to do. And then the third thing. Is commit to God's labour. You know. We should all be not just members of a church. But workers in the church. Working for Jesus. Finding something to do. It might be something quite unseen by other folk. Um, there was a man I can't give you his name offhand but he funded the whole building of a wonderful big mission hall in Glasgow the, the, it's gone from me no, not the ceiling um, he funded it he paid for everything in the place and it could see a thousand and there weren't any pillars to obstruct the views <laughs> of the folk there. It was specially designed <coughs> for the maximum contact between the speakers and the audience. And he said, um, I'll fund it in one condition. And the one condition is that you don't mention my name 
and reports until I die. He said, because I want to honour God in my giving. And that's what he did. One of many things he did, committing to God's labour. God calls us to be labourers in his vineyard. And the greatest pleasure in life is to know God's smile and blessing as we work for him. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for being on the frontier of a new year. We thank you for giving us strength, for strengthening Flo and other folk in the congregation at this time. Thank you that Norman's here tonight. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you'll work in our hearts and lives, strengthening us, giving us a sound awareness of your warm love to us in the Lord Jesus through the Spirit. Help us to remember your leadership that you're leading us to humble us and that God plows in our life to bring <coughs> forth fruit and help us, O oh Lord, to give you thanks for all that you do for us and help us to give you thanks not only with our words but in our lives and actions and for your blessing in this new year. Pray for the fellowship and its leadership at this time. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
Lord, we thank you for everything we've heard tonight. Thank you for the exhortation, Lord, to remember you are a good God. Oh, Lord, we cannot begin to tell of all the wonderful things you've done. And, Lord, all that you have for us. And we thank you, Lord, and we do pray, Lord, you'll help each one of us, Lord, to know that we're loved. Lord, to be led of you and to labour for you. And Lord, as we stand at the frontier of this new year, that we might step forward in faith, knowing, Lord, that he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. So bless our fellowship, bless our time together, and be in our conversation. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God.